okay so hopefully you guys are all doing well catching up with your homework so let me go ahead and share my screen with you and i'll show you what we're doing today so before i start uh, so hopefully you guys can see my screen now again if you want to speak through your audio you can do it as well so before i start i do want to show you something on web work so okay so this was something i was doing earlier but can you ignore all of this? So if you go to uh, your homework set, you will see that I modified some of the due dates, not all of them, some. So you should be finishing up the zero orientation, the zero assignment. Make sure you know how to do that one because it guides you through how to input answers. So remember to do that. So that's due on the 30th of June. You still have time. So if you don't want to complete it, fully you can still come back on and off so that's open until the end of this month you should finish up chapter one we did that last two class so that should be done and then start working on 2.2 and 2.1 so the ones that are due this week so it's the seventh so if i have it right on my calendar yeah so that's due this sunday so make sure you finish up chapter one 2.1.2 and so there's nothing for 2.4 we might get to that section today but okay so these are the right question from you but here if you go to my web page under the recommended homework problems these are from the textbook and the solutions to these problems are also online so you cut up and verify your work so this is addition to what you're going to be doing on web work. So for for 2.4, this section, there is no homework, I believe, in the web work. So you can do those questions from the textbook. If you have the 10th or the 11th edition, you can work on those questions from the recommended page. Because there's no questions on web work. Okay. All right. So having said that, let's start today's lesson. All right, so I'm set my audio. Okay, so again, let me know if you guys have any trouble. We're going to start our lesson for today. Okay, so just a um, few reminders for what's coming up. So, so first, uh, you should start working on web work. Okay, and you should finish up the zero assignment. Uh, chapter 1, 2.1, and 2.2. Up to that point, you should finish up before Sunday because they're all due on the 7th. So so not, not the 0th, but these are due on the 7th, okay? And then the next reminder I want to give you is our first quiz is coming up. So quiz 1. That's going to take place on Tuesday. So that will be next Tuesday. Uh, that's the ninth. Okay. So the quiz will take place after class. So, so the time for this quiz is 7.40 to 8 o'clock. So you'll have 20 minutes right after class to take the quiz, okay? And then, uh, so the, the topic for the quiz is going to be uh, up to today's lecture. And now uh, four questions. Okay. 
So that's going to be on Blackboard. The, the way that you took the pre-quiz, the same way you'll go to that mater course materials. Under course materials, you'll find the quiz. It will appear exactly at 7. So right after class, you can take it. So, so the questions will be similar to web work and what I do in class. Okay, so it's going to be um, web work should help you prepare for the quiz and the recommended questions are also helpful. So, yeah. Okay. Okay, any other questions before we start? So that's the reminder I have for you, just two reminders. Start doing web work and there is a quiz coming up next week, Tuesday. And that's our first quiz, so I, I think you should feel excited, <laughs> right? I think it's a good feeling to feel excited. Okay, do, do you guys have any other questions? Okay, so uh, if there are no questions, I'm gonna go ahead and start. So, so, so far, what do we know? We, we talked about method one. So for first order. To solve first order ODEs. So we know method one. So I'm calling method one to be separable. So we'll call it separation of variables. Right? So if your equation is separable, then you use this method. That means you can express the function or the given equation as a function of x times dx plus another function of y times dy equals to some constancy, okay? So when we're able to do that to a differential equation, we use the method of separation of variables. Then second method I talked about last time was if the equation is homogeneous, then you can use the second method, which is to come up with this substitution. So we use the substitution b is equal to y uh, over x. So that means dy dx is going to be v plus x dv dx. So these are the two substitution we make if the equation happened to be homogeneous. Okay, so that's where I'm going to start off today. I will do one example on homogeneous and then we'll move on to the third method. So let's let's work on this. Um, professor? Uh-huh. For it to be homogeneous, it has to be y over x in that form? Yeah, because we want to stick to this substitution. Okay. Got it. Mm -hmm. So let's let's well before I start doing an example, I also mentioned how can we check if the ODE is homogeneous, right? So let's do a quick example on that. So here's an example. So check if if the ODE is homogeneous. Okay, so let's check that. So suppose I give you this differential equation dy dx is equal to 3y squared minus x squared over 2xy. So I want you to just check it if it is homogeneous. You don't have to solve it. We'll solve a different question. So to check this, we're going to use the substitution x with k times x and y with k times y. And then at the end, if it's going, if it gives us the original function, then we call it the homogeneous. Okay. So let's check. So I'm going to plug in dy dx is equal to 
three times k times y. So that's ky squared minus, so x will be substituted with k times x. So that's kx squared over 2k times x times k times y. And then we try to simplify it and see if it gives us the original equation we had. So if I just continue to simplify, we have 3k squared y squared minus k squared x squared over 2k squared xy. Okay. And then by doing further simplification, I can pull out a k squared on top. We have 3y squared minus x squared over k squared 2 times xy. And then here I can cancel out these squares. So that will give us the following. So this would simplify to 3y squared minus x squared over 2xy. Is that the original equation we had? Yeah, right? Yeah, so check. So this, it is homogeneous. So that's one way you can verify before using the method, just quickly make the substitution and check if it's a homogeneous equation, okay? Now let's, let's do a solving. Let's solve the following problem. So example two, solve dy dx is equal to negative 4x plus 3y over 2x plus y. Okay, so it's not separable, right? And it's not linear, so we're going to use the homogeneous method. And if you want to verify again, you can make this quick substitution, k times x and k times y, and you will see it gives you the original equation back. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, use the substitution v equals y over x. But before I do that, I'm going to go ahead and divide every term by x so that we, ha we can make the substitution. So we have dy dx is equal to negative. So 4x over x plus 3y over x over 2x over x plus y over x. So we divided every single term by x so that we can have the substitution y over x appearing in our equation. So this would simplify to negative 4 plus three times y over x, that's what we wanted, over two plus y over x. Okay, now let's introduce the substitution. We're going to let v equals y over x. And um, I, I like to write it this way, then y is equal to vx. So that means if I differentiate this dy, dx, we have v plus x dv dx. So this is coming from product rule, differentiating v and x because v is a function, not a constant, okay? So now let's substitute these two magical expression, v is y over x and dy dx is these terms into our original equation and see what we got. So we have, so we have dy dx. Well, that's going to be replaced with v plus x dv dx is equal to, and then we have negative four plus three v over two plus v. So we have successfully made the substitution we wanted. And up to this point, we, we're just going to simplify so that it looks like separable, right? It has to become separable at this point. So I'm going to go ahead and distribute this negative first. So I'm going to put parentheses around 4 plus 3v and then subtract v from both sides. So we have x dv 
dx is equal to negative 4 minus 3v over 2 plus v minus v. Okay. And then the left side, I want to put them in common denominators. So I have negative 4 minus, uh, so if I do that, I have 5v minus v square all over 2 plus v is equal to x times dv dx. So that's what we get after we put the left side using common denominators. Well, now it's separable, right? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to separate the variables. So we have 2 plus v over negative v square minus 5v minus 4 dv is equal to 1 over x dx. Okay. So it's separable. So up to this point, this is separable. Well, now we want to integrate, right? But now this can be a little tricky with algebra. So I'm going to try to get rid of the negative from the left side. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to force a negative. Should I do that? Yeah, so I'm going to force a negative out and I'm going to move the negative to the right side. So I can write it this way. 2 plus v over v square plus 5v four dv is equal to negative one over x dx. So I force the negative out from the v's and I put it on the right side so that it, I can factor the left side, okay? Now we can integrate. So how do we integrate the left side? Any suggestions on that? Um, can we also take the partial fraction method and split the function into two different right. functions, find A yeah. and B? Mm -hmm. Good. So we're going to have to use partial fraction decomposition. So for this, we have to use partial fraction. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and rewrite. 2 plus v over, so v squared plus 5v plus 4, you can reduce that into v plus 4 and v plus 1. That will give us v squared plus 5v plus 4. And then I can decompose this into a over v plus 4 plus b over v plus 1. That's the partial fraction decompositions. And now you have to compute, you have to find what is A and what is B. So this is a good review of how to use partial fraction. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and multiply both sides by V plus 4 and V plus 1. So we have the following. 2 plus V is equal to A times V plus 1 plus B times V plus 4. And now to solve for A and B, I'm going to pick values for V. So if I let V to be, uh, if I let V to be negative 4, I have negative 2 is equal to A times negative 4 plus 1, that's negative 3, and the second term goes to 0. So that's why I pick negative 4, which means A is equal to, 2 over 3. So, oh, that's nice, right? We found A. Let's compute what B is. So for B, I'm going to fix V to be negative 1. So that get rid of the term with A. So we have 2 minus 1, that's 1, is equal to um, uh, B times, so negative 1 plus 4, that's 3 which means we can find b is equal to 1 over 3. So there you go. We have our unknown constants, and that's what we're going to plug in here. So our integration is going to become, so I'm going to use this part. So now we can integrate. So we have 
the integral of a over v plus 4, or a is 2 third, v plus 4 plus b, well, b we just found, that's 1 third over v plus 1. And integrating this respect to v is equal to the right side. Well, what's the integral of negative L 1 over x? So you guys got it. Thank you, all of you. Plus constant C, right? So the left side, now we can integrate freely. We have 2 thirds. And both of these are ln, right? We have L of V plus 4 plus 1 third. Ln of V plus 1 is equal to negative Ln of X plus C. So you can say, yes, you're done. <laughs> we found all this, everything we wanted, but you want to make it, your solution look nice and neat. So we can do more work on this solution. So I'm going to go ahead and get rid of the 3, the fraction 1 third, by multiplying by 3. So we have 2 ln of v plus 4 plus ln of v plus 1 is equal to negative 3 ln of x plus 3 times c is just another constant. So I'm just going to put it as a c. Okay. And again, you can make this much more prettier. I can make the 2 as an exponent and then use the laws of logarithm. So we have ln of, uh, so when you have a product between two, L, uh, sorry, when you have a sum between two lns, how do we join them into a single logarithm? Do you guys remember that? So recall. If you have ln of a plus ln of b, what is the rule? Right, you can make it into product, right, multiply. So this will be ln of a times b. So same idea I'm going to apply here. First, I'm going to make the 2 as an exponent. So that's v plus 4 to the 2 power times uh, ln of that expression. So I'm going to put a so maybe I should write it differently. So I'm going to do it this way. So I have v plus 4 to the second power and v plus 1. And all of this inside ln equals to negative 3 ln of x plus c. And then the next thing would be to um, uh, plug in what is v. Initially, v was y over x, so I'm going to substitute that. So we have ln of y over x uh, plus 4 squared, and y over x plus 1. Everything inside the ln is equal to, and here again, this one, I'm going to make it as an exponent so I can simplify it more. So we have ln of x to the negative 3 plus a constant c. And now I'm going to exponentiate both sides. So that simplifies my answer further into this. y over x plus 4 square y over x plus 1 is equal to um, c times x to the negative 3. And then again, you can play around with this more by putting them in common denominator for the x's. So you have y plus 4x over x squared. y plus x over x is equal to c times x to the negative 3. And then by further simplification, I can multiply both sides by x to the cube. That will get rid of the denominators for the left side. We have y plus 4x to the second power. y plus x is equal to constant c. So that will be the furthest we can go. So we have the simplified answer right here. So any questions on this problem? I think this was a nice problem, right? It involves kind of calculus and pre-calculus.
So why is it multiplied by C? So that's coming from here. So if you look carefully, you're exponentiating this plus C. So by using the laws of exponents, I can rewrite this is E to the ln of X to the negative three times E to the C. Well, E to the C is just another constant, right? Because E is a constant. So that's why I have C times and then E to the ln x to a negative three, it cancels out. Okay. okay. All right, so uh, any questions on the problem? So this was a bit of a long problem, but of course it explains all the steps that we can really go through, borrowing stuff from calculus, borrowing things from pre-calculus and putting everything together. And we have a really nice solution to this. All right, so, uh, so that's homogeneous. Let me know if you guys have any questions. Um, professor, where did the uh, x to the negative third, where did that go? It just integrated into the c? Oh, no, it didn't. I simplified. So right here in this stage, I uh, so I didn't show steps, how I got to the last step. So we had y plus 4x to the second power, well, in absolute value, over x to the second power times y plus x over x. So these two, that's x to the third. Oh, OK. I, I see it. Yeah, I canceled it with x to the negative 3, because if you cross multiply them, they cancel out. All right, uh, any other questions? Okay, so if, if there are no questions, moving on to 2.1. So section 2.1, we're going to study linear first order, so linear equations. And we're going to study how to solve them. So we'll be using the method of integrating factor of integrating factor. All right, uh, Anik, do you have a question? Um. Yeah, Professor. So. So in the uh, in the quiz or um, exam, right? Will you ask us to uh, draw the direction field and uh, integral curve from the from the equation you got in the question? Uh, probably not. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't ask you to draw them, but you have to do them for homework, right? But uh, that's very confusing. Like how to approach that. Uh, how to draw the graph from the equation all right so uh if you found if you found it to be confusing if you revisit my notes from yesterday's class i mm -hmm. drew two examples so maybe look look them over and then if you need more help i can help you out with office hours okay Thank okay you. yeah but uh yeah i wouldn't put that on a test that's a that's very time consuming so if you do the homework problem that's good enough for slow field Okay, so, uh, uh, all right, so moving on to 2.1, we're going to study first order linear equations, and we're going to solve them by using the method of integrating factor. But before we start, we have to know, how do we write linear equations in standard form, okay? So for first order, linear differential equations in standard form. So standard form means we have dy dx plus a function of 
p of x times y is equal to a function g of x. So that's a standard form, okay, where the derivative is by itself, the constant in front of the derivative is 1. Okay. So this is where we consider standard form. So it could be written this way, or you could write y prime plus p of x times y is equal to g of x. So any of these two form consider standard form linear first order. Okay. Now, how do we solve this? So So we need an integrating factor which I'm going to call it mu of x. So denote it by mu of x. I think in, um, in web work they use alpha of x or sigma of x but it's really the integrating factor you're looking at. So they could be using a different symbol. But that's totally fine. Um, I like to use mu of x because it's consistent with the textbook, I think. <laughs> uh, yeah. So we, we're looking for this integrating factor mu of x so that when when we multiply this mu of x to the first and the, the standard form, we have the following. So when it is multiplied equation in standard form, in the left side. So we have this. So if you multiply mu of x to the uh, standard form, you have mu of x times y prime plus mu of x times p of x times y is equal to mu of x times g of x. So what I did was I took my standard form and I multiplied both sides by mu of x, this magical function mu of x. The question is, what is this function? Okay, so I'm going to show you the derivation, how to get to the formula for mu of x, but at the end you just have to remember what is this function. Okay, so enjoy the derivation. You don't have to know the derivation on the test or a quiz, but it's a good mathematical way of understanding where things are really coming from without just giving you the formula. Okay, so the first step to the derivation is to take the standard form, multiply it by mu of x, some unknown function that we're looking for. Now we're going to force something to happen. So what we want, we want this one right here, the left side, to be the derivative of mu of x times y. That's what we want. We want the left side to be that expression. So well, what is that? So if I were to differentiate mu of x times, so let's call this star, okay? And then coming back to the derivative of mu of x times y. So by differentiating this using product rule, we have the following. So differentiate the first mu prime of x times y and then for the second part we're going to um, what are we going to do you keep the first and um, differentiate the second so apply product rule so that I have the derivative of mu of x times y. Well, now what are we going to do? We're going to take this and set it equal to the left-hand side. So we want this mu 
the derivative of mu of x times y to equal the left hand side of the equation star. So that's mu of x times y prime plus mu of x p of x. So times that's what we want. But what is the derivative of mu of x times y? So we just computed that. That will be prime of x times y plus mu of x times y prime is equal to mu x y prime plus mu of x p of x times y. Well, now here, what can we do? We can simplify, right? So if you look at carefully, this one and this one, they are exactly the same. So we can cancel these out. So we have the following. We have mu prime of x times y is equal to mu of x times p of x times y. Okay. Uh, so what can we do here? So what I'm going to do, both sides, I have y, right? So I can get rid of the y's. So let me know if you guys have questions so far. Right, so ver, Verhan, you, you have it right, y. So that's also a common term. So let's get rid of them. So we have the following then. You have mu prime of x is equal to mu of x p of x. OK. Well. Now at this point, this looks like something we can solve. So I'm going to rewrite mu of x because it, I'm going to use a different notation. So I can write this as d mu over dx, another notation for derivative, and then mu of x times p of x. And this is separable. Do you agree? You can separate and you separate the x. So if I separate the variables, I have the following. d mu over mu of x is equal to p of x dx. So that's separable. And now to solve for this function mu, I can go ahead and integrate both sides. So big integration sign. <laughs> so if I integrate the left side, this is ln of mu of x. Well, on the right side, the integration will depend on what is this function p of x is, right? So we don't know, so we're just going to leave it as the integral of p of x dx. Now, keep this in mind. We want mu of x to be a positive function for temporary, OK? Just because we don't want to deal with absolute value. So I'm going to go ahead and remove the absolute value. We have ln of mu of x is equal to the integral of p of x dx. And now the last thing to solve for mu of x, we're going to exponentiate both sides. So hence, we have this magical function we're after. Mu of x is equal to e to the integral of p of x dx. And that's the formula for integrating factor. So this is an integrating factor. So yes, it took us a while to get there, but you see where things are coming from. So, so. so there we have our integrating factor. So any questions for the derivation? Now, you don't have to derive them. Every single time you have a question where you're solving a linear equation, you just have to use this integrating factor. Now, now that we have an integrating factor, let me show you how to use this factor to find solutions to the linear equations. Any questions so far? 
So here's an example. Let's solve the differential equation x y prime minus um, y is equal to x cubed. So you stare at this equation and you decide, is this separable? Is this um, homogeneous, right? Because those are the two methods we already have in our toolbox. So it's not separable. You can play around with it and it's not. It's not homogeneous either. You can plug in the substitution k times x and k times y to see if you get the original equation. So that means it's, it's most likely linear, right? And because we're doing 2.1, it has to be linear. So it is linear. Now, the first thing, so here are the steps. Steps for using the method of integrating factor. So I will give you the steps on the side and I will guide through this problem as well. So the first step is to express the ODE in standard form. So SF is for standard form. Okay, so I'm gonna, to write it in standard form, well, the derivative has to be coefficient of one, right? So we're gonna get rid of the X by dividing through X. So we have Y prime, minus 1 over x y is equal to x squared. So that's our step number one. Now once you have written it in standard form, you want to determine what is the p of x. Well, so what is p of x in this form? Is it negative 1 over x? Yep, so p of x is the function in front of y. So if you go back right here, p of x is the function in front of y, and g of x is the function on the right side of the equation. So p of x for this problem is going to be negative 1 over x. So once we have identified p of x, we want to determine the integrating factor. So compute mu of x, which is given by this formula e to the integral of p of x dx. That's our magical integrating factor. So we're going to compute mu of x. That's e to the integral of negative 1 over x dx. So this will give us e to the negative ln of x. And of course, plus c, I'm going to reserve it for at the end. Okay, so we're going to hold on to that until the very end. So if I simplify this, this is just um, 1 over x, OK? So once you find your mu of x, you want to check that the left side of uh, left side of the standard form is the derivative times mu of x times y. So you want to check that's the left side. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take my standard form and I'm going to multiply it by mu of x, 1 over x. So if you recall, again, from the past, we, we took this function mu of x and we multiplied it to our standard form. That's why we got the equation star. So that's what I'm doing. And then we're going to check that the left side is the derivative of mu of x times y. So that's what we're going to do. So once you determine mu of x, you multiply it to your standard form, and you have the following, 1 over x times y prime minus 1 over x square uh, y is equal to x. So once we do that, the left side is going to be the derivative of mu of x, that's 1 over x, times y is equal to x. So that's step four. You're checking mentally, is that true? When you differentiate 1 over x, 
you get negative 1 over x squared times y plus, and then keep 1 over x differentiate y, that's y prime. So check. So I'm going to check for this one. So that's a mental check. Well, now keep going with the steps. We have, so we have that. Well, how do we get rid of the differentiation sign? We integrate, right? So step five will be to integrate both sides. So we integrate both sides. respect to x. So we have, so when you integrate and differentiate at the same time, the operations, they cancel out, right? So we have 1 over x times y is equal to, and the integral of x respect to x is going to be 1 half x squared. And now I'm going to put in my integration constant plus c. And the last thing would be to solve for y. So Six is solved. So I can solve for y by multiplying by x. So hence y is equal to uh, one half x cubed plus c times x. So that's our solution to this problem. So there we have the method of integrating factor. So any questions on any of the steps we took? Let me just put it all in one page. Um, professor? Uh-huh. Uh, so where the red check mark is, I don't know how that went into that form in the, right below that. Oh, so, so, we, um, so from the proof, we said that we're going to force this to happen. When you multiply your left-hand side and right-hand side by mu of x, you have this equation star, right? So we're going to force the left-hand side to be the derivative of mu of x times y. If we do that, then we have the following differential equation. So that's what I try to do here. But I'll show you one more. Uh, so, uh, Right, so uh, Sadia and Leon, I think you guys kind of answered that question. Why don't we put CX as a C? Well, X is not a constant, right? It's a function. So you can't combine a function and a constant together. You can only combine constant and numbers together, but not functions, okay? So that's why I kept C times X, not just another constant. So uh, going back to um, your question, <laughs> how did I get to this step? So check this out. Why are these two statements true? So I'll put that on a side note. So oh. I'm playing with that. Oh, do you see it? Yeah, is the bottom one the derivative product rule and the top is what we get? Yeah, yeah. So we kind of went the reverse direction. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So it's always true. It's always true. Once you find your integrating factor mu of x, you take that and you multiply it to your standard form. It's always the derivative times mu, derivative of mu of x times y. So uh, maybe I should add one more step, right? So compute mu of x. So three star, okay, is to multiply the standard form by mu of x. Because once you do that, then it becomes step four, which is that it's the derivative of mu of x times y. So do I still need to show or you got it? I got it. Thank you. Okay. All right. So let me do another example. That way we have a little more practice on this. So just keep in mind to follow the steps. I think it's very uh, crucial that we have steps for this method. So here's our second example that's also linear. So I want to solve, uh, what do I want to solve? I want to solve an initial value problem. So let's do solve the IVP. So suppose you have y prime 
plus 1 over x plus 5 times y is equal to x to the negative 2 power with the initial condition y of 1 is equal to 6. So I'll give you a minute to, you know, digest everything. So <laughs> I know it's one minute is not a lot, but uh, hopefully I'll at least get you started on where to start. So maybe compute up to mu of x. Okay, so I'll start in a minute. Okay, so uh, let, let's start working on this problem. Hopefully you had some ideas written down. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, write it in standard form. It's already in standard form. Oh, how nice, wonderful, great. It's in standard form because y prime is by itself, right? The coefficient of y prime is one, so that's good. Now let's identify what is p of x. What is p of x for this problem? Or x plus 5. Yep, so that's this function right here. Now we're going to compute mu of x, so that's the next step. Mu of x is going to be um, e to the integral of p of x, that's 1 over x plus 5 dx, so that will give us e to the ln of x plus 5. Again, you can drop the absolute values because we're assuming p of x is positive. Mu of x is positive, so ln of x plus 5. And then, um, yeah. So that will simplify to just x plus 5. So now the next step is to take this function mu of x and multiply it to your standard form. So we have the following. We have y prime times x plus 5 plus 1 over x plus 5 times x plus 5 times y is equal to x to the negative 2 times x plus 5. And, well, you can simplify, right, a little bit more. y prime x plus 5 plus y is equal to, and here I can simplify by distributing these guys out. So I have x to the negative 1 plus 5x to the negative 2. Okay, so we multiplied mu of x to our standard form, which forces us to have this term to be the derivative of mu of x, which is x plus 5 in this case, times y. is equal to x times negative 1 plus 5x to the negative 2. Now you can check, is this step the last step on the left side, is it derivative to the step above? You can check that mentally and the answer is yes, okay? And now we're gonna integrate both sides. So I'm gonna go ahead and integrate the left side and right side with respect to x. So any questions, let me know. So once we integrate, the left side becomes x plus 5 times y is equal to, well, on the right side, you want to integrate. So the first one is ln of x, and the second one is negative uh, 5 over x. And 
plus c. Okay. And the last thing would be to solve for y. So we divide by x plus 5. We have y is equal to ln of x over x plus 5. So, um, you know, I'm just going to write it this way. This one big fraction instead of tiny little ones. So we have um, the following. We have ln of x minus 5 over x plus c all over x plus 5. So that's one way you can write your solution. But of course, if you want to simplify it more, you could do that as well. Well, now we have an initial condition. y of 1 equals 6. Well, any questions up to the general solution? Does it make sense to you guys? Okay, so Liana and Alex, yeah. All right, thank you. So I'm going to continue finding value for C. So y of 1 equals 6. So we have 6 is equal to x is 1. So we have ln of 1 minus 5 over 1 plus c over 1 plus 5, that's 6. OK, so uh, oh, never forget ln of 1, right? <laughs> uh, that's 0. So we have 36 is equal to negative 5 plus c. And then I add 5 to both sides. So we have 36 plus 5, 41 equals C. So that's our C. So our particular solution is going to be Y equals uh, ln of X minus 5 over X plus 41 over X plus 5. So that will be our particular solution to this problem. So any question on this? Any questions on this method? So this is the third method we have. That's the integrating factor. So we have one more method. And then we're done with first order. So let me know if you guys have any questions. Okay, so if there are no more questions, moving on to the next problem. So here's our third example. Let's, um, let's see. So let's, let's try this one. Let's solve uh, t times y prime plus 2y is equal to 4t square. So I'll give you a minute to work on this one. See how far you can finish. Okay, are you guys ready? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, so uh, it's linear, right? It's not separable. It's not homogeneous. So you can check on all of those. It's linear, so perfect. Well, first thing is to write it in standard form. So I'm going to go ahead and write it in standard form because it's not. So SF is standard form it's so we divide by t y prime plus 2 over t times y is equal to 4t and now you want to identify what is p of x 
well, not P of X, P of T in this case, because your independent variable is T. So P of T is what? What is P of T? 2 over T. Yep, so that's 2 over T. And now we're going to determine what is our mu of T. So that's E to the integral of, so 2, I can always pull it out, the integral, 1 over T dt. So this will be e to the 2 ln of t. And to simplify this, this would just be t squared. OK? And now we take our standard form and multiply with uh, mu of t. So that will give us uh, y prime t squared plus 2 2t. Two because over t will cancel one of the t, times y is equal to 4t cubed. Once we do that, we know the left side is always going to be the derivative respect to t. I'm keep writing x because it's just stuck in my head. <laughs> uh, it's the derivative of mu of t, that's t squared, times y is equal to 4t cubed. So we can quickly check that the left side is the derivative of t squared times y. So you can do that mental check. So, and now we're going to integrate both sides. Respect to t, so this will give us t squared times y is equal to, if I integrate 4t cubed, we get t to the 4 plus c. And to solve for y, lastly, we're going to divide by t squared so that's y is equal to t to the fourth plus c time over t squared. So that's to the negative 2 power. And that will be our final solution to this. So let me know if you guys have any questions or you want me to show any steps. So I do skip some steps sometimes <laughs> uh, because I'm assuming you can follow. But again, let me know if you want me to show more steps. I can do that always. So any questions on this problem? OK, so uh, I would say if you if you can do 50 oh, more problems. Uh -huh. Shouldn't it be t, y equals t squared plus c e to the negative 2? Um, I thank you for that to divide the t to the fourth. Oh, you're right. You're absolutely right. I missed the first one because we're dividing it by t squared. So thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> Typo from my side. So y is equal to t squared plus c times t to the negative 2. OK, yep. Thank you. All right, so uh, after doing 50 problems, I'm sure you'll master how to use this method. So you got homework problems to do from web work. That's like 18 of them, so not too many. And then you have the recommended question from the textbook, so that's another 10 or 15. That should help you enough to understand all of these methods. So no, take some time. Take, take some time. And um, again, you, you, when you're studying for any math exam or quiz, I would say study for a good two hours or three hours. Take a break, you know, a good break, and then come back, study again. Don't study straight five hours. I think that's a lot of heavy work for your brain. But again, you can decide what works best for you. <laughs> right, so Sadia agrees with me. So thank you. All right, so that's, that's method number three. That will conclude our session for 2.1. Now I'm going to move on to 2.4. So 2.4 is a fun topic. They're all fun, but 2.4 is more like a theoretical stuff. We're, we're not going to do a lot of computation, but it, it always helps us to understand some of the theory behind the solutions to first order. OK, so here, here's 2.4. And then after 2.4, we're going to study the last method for solving first order. So moving on to uh, 2.4. So again, 2.4, there is no assignments on web work for 2.4. So if you want to do practice question, you have to look at the recommended 
PDF file on my webpage that will help you to understand 2.4, okay? So 2.4 is its title, Uniqueness and Existence. So we're going to talk about the theory of uniqueness and existence for first order linear differential equations. So it's only for linear, okay? So not for homogeneous or for any other type of ODEs. So here's the theorem that's directly from the textbook. I'm going to state it how it is stated in the textbook. And of course, you don't have to know the theorem. You don't have to memorize it word by word. But you just want to understand the theorem. What is it saying? How can we use it when we're solving problems? So that's the idea with this section. So the only theorem I'm going to state is 2.4.1. This is from the textbook. And this is called existence and uniqueness. theorem for first order linear equations. So since you have seen how to solve first order linear differential equation, here's a theorem that goes along with it. So the formal statement goes this way. So first I'm going to give you the statement and then I'll explain it to you uh, how this is useful when we're looking for solutions to linear equations. So if, if the functions P of X, uh, so it could be P of T as well. So let me just call it P and, uh, P and G. Just give me one more second. Yeah, so I use G. Okay. So if, if the function P and G are continuous, on an open interval, I, so I is the interval. So let's say it's between alpha and beta containing the point. So this is the initial condition T equals T naught. Then there exist a unique solution. So we're going to call it a function. So this unique function y equals phi of t that satisfies the differential equation y prime plus p of t times y is equal to g of t for each point t in the interval I. Okay. And also satisfies the initial condition why T naught is why not? Where why not is an arbitrary 
the initial value. <coughs> okay, so that's a lot of word, right? <laughs> uh, formal statements are usually wrong, but let me break it down for you. So what are we looking at? So the key ideas are we're looking at a first order linear differential equation in this form y prime plus p of t times y is equal to g of t. What the statement says is if the functions p and g, so p and g are continuous on some open interval i, and it contains the initial point, so you'll be given an initial value, where then, there, then we can talk about uniqueness and existence, okay? So this theorem, it, it's saying that if this conditions hold, then there is a unique solution. And we're calling the unique solution a unique function that contains all the initial point. That's the idea of this theorem. So let's, let's do an example to see how you can apply this theorem. Now, any question on the theorem so far? Okay, so let me give you an example to illustrate this. So suppose, uh, so use theorem 2.4.1 to find an interval. So in which the initial value problem. So let's look at t times y prime plus 2y is equal to 4t square with the initial condition y of 1 is equal to 2 has a unique solution. Okay, so we want to determine using this theorem that we just saw, that where is the unique solution for this differential equation, for this initial condition, okay? So, well, what do we have to figure out? We have to figure out that P and G are continuous. Where is the interval where P and G are continuous? So let's identify those functions. But first, you wanna put it in standard form. Now, do you guys follow where I'm going with this? Yes. OK, so I'm looking for my function p and g by writing this in standard form. So in standard form, okay. all right, so uh, thank you, guys. So we have y prime plus 2 over t times y is equal to 4t. So p of t is 2 over t, and g of t is 4t. So we have to know the interval where p and g are continuous. So that means you're really looking for the domain of these functions. So if you remember the word, word domain from the past, what is the domain for p? Where is this function continuous? Uh, so, all real numbers uh, except zero? Right, so because zero is the only trouble with P, so we have the open interval negative infinity to zero, union zero to infinity, open. Then we need to find where is the function G continuous? Where is G continuous? From negative infinity to infinity? Yep, so it's just a polynomial, so we have the open interval negative infinity to infinity. So we have the interval where they're both continuous, right? So now we have to look at where is the interval that they're both continuous, both of them together. So we want to know the domain for P intersect domain for G. Where is that domain? 
negative infinity to zero, zero mm -hmm. to infinity? Yeah. So the intersection for these two to be continuous is going to be this one. Okay, so we found the first condition where P and G are continuous on some open interval I. So that's I. Now, we want to find the interval where it contains the initial point. So what is the initial point? Where is T naught? So you're given Y of 1 is equal to 2 which means t naught is the x value, right? So that's 1. Now, from these two open intervals, where, which interval contains the initial point? 0 to infinity. Right. So, so since 0 to infinity contains the initial point, T naught equals one. So we are guaranteed unique solution in the interval zero to infinity. So that will be the conclusion to this problem. So we have unique solution on this interval. So these are the work you are expected to do when you're looking for a unique solution. And we can also say there exist. So you can think of the uniqueness and existence at the same time that if, if there is a solution and it's unique, so you can say there exists a unique solution on the interval zero to infinity. So that will be a type of question. Now, what if I, um, go ahead. Um, are we looking for just an interval in this kind of problem? Yeah, so if you look at the question, find an interval uh, in which the initial problem has a unique solution. Yeah. Yeah, so we're not solving. But if you were to solve it, you would see that once you have the general solution, the solution is only defined on the interval negative infinity to zero and zero to infinity. But the initial, once you apply the initial condition, y of 1 equals 2, then you have a unique solution. And that is only containing the interval 0 to infinity. So it's very important that we talk about uniqueness and existence for differential equations. OK, now what if, so let's modify this. What if the initial condition was, um, let's say y of negative one equals three. Where do we have a unique solution? Negative infinity to zero. Right, so now your t naught is a negative one and that's containing the other interval. So, so since, so for this one, t naught is negative one, so we have unique solution on the interval negative infinity to zero. And that will be the conclusion you would draw. Okay. All right, so any questions on this problem? Okay, so let me give you another question. So here's the second problem. So determine an interval in which the solution of the given initial value problem is certain to exist. So t minus 3y prime plus t equal to 2t two and y of 1 is 2. So I'll give you a minute to come up with the 
interval or at least where these functions are continuous. Okay, so let's do this one. So you, you must identify what is P of T and what is G of T. Okay, so uh, hopefully you guys are ready by now. So, uh, so before I identify P and G, I'm gonna put this in standard form. So we have uh, Y prime plus ln of T over T minus three times Y is equal to two T over T minus three, okay? Now let's identify P of T and G of T. So P is the function in front of Y. That's ln of T over T minus three. And G is the function on the right side. So we have two T over T minus three. Okay, so hopefully you guys got those functions. Well, now let's find, the, find where these functions are continuous. So what is the domain for P? So you, you want to remember <laughs> from pre-calculus or algebra, what's the domain of ln? Uh, is it from zero to infinity? Wait, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got it right. So good job. But is zero included or not? Uh, yes. Wait, no, no, no. Mm. No, it's, it's not, right? Because if you plug in zero, what is ln of zero? We can't talk about it, right? We have to take the zero. limit as we get closer to zero from the right. So ln of zero, well, it doesn't exist. <laughs> so the domain, right, undefined, yeah, or we can say negative infinity because if you take the limit as you approach from the right side, I think right side, yeah, if you come from the right side, you get negative infinity. So, yeah, we can say a negative infinity. We don't care. We just want to say zero to infinity, open. And now the bottom we have t minus three for p of t. So that means the domain of p is going to be zero to three and then three to infinity because if you plug in three, we get in trouble in the bottom. So the domain where p is continuous is zero to three union three to infinity. That's where p is continuous. Any questions on that? Okay, again, let me know if you guys have questions. Now, what about for G? What is the domain for G? So the top is a linear function, the bottom is a linear function, but the bottom cannot be zero. So we remove three from the domain. So we have negative infinity to three, union three to infinity. So that's where G is continuous. Now, where is the domain that both of these are continuous, P and G? So the domain for P and G to be continuous, that's going to be um, zero to three and then three to infinity, okay? 
Well, now let's use the theorem so we we see which interval contains our initial point. So we're looking at t naught to be one. So one is in which interval? Zero to three. Right. So we have unique solution on the interval zero to three. So that would be the interval where we have unique solution. Okay. So any questions on this problem? All right. So Aisha, you got it. Okay. So uh, yeah. So that that's two point four. So it's just again going back to more of algebra review and kind of putting everything together and applying it to this course, okay? So that's the end of 2.4. The next section I have is 2.6, which is the last method we're going to do for, um, for first order differential equation. But I'm not gonna do that today, I'm gonna do that next class. <laughs> so uh, if you guys have any questions, I can go over them now but this will be the end for today's lecture. So uh, we're going to have a quiz next class. Uh, well, after class, right? So the quiz will be 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, and um, chapter one where you classify differential equations. So know how to classify order, if it's linear, nonlinear, um, if it's an ODE or PDE, so that will be something I can ask you from first chapter. And then know how to solve first order, homogeneous, separable, and uh, linear. <laughs> the one we just did today. <laughs> OK. Uh, so uh, Sadia, yes, I can do more problem with you guys. Uh, what kind of problem do you want to see? Linear, homogeneous, or um, separable? 2.4. Okay, so let, let's do a problem from 2.4. So, so again, we're going to be using the theorem 2.4.1 and try to determine the interval where we have a unique solution. So let me give you a question from the homework. So here's a problem for you to work on. Okay, so let's do this one. So the instruction is the same, use theorem 2.4.1 to determine the interval where the initial value problem has a unique solution, okay? So let's try this one. Y prime plus tangent of T times Y is equal to sine of T, given the initial condition Y of pi is equal to zero. So I'll give you a minute to come up with the interval. So um, I don't want to run out of time, so I'm going to start working on it. Let me know if you have questions. So let's identify our functions P and G correctly. So it's already in standard form, right? So I'll just check that. Now, P of T, in this case, is tangent 
of t. And g of t is sine of t. Okay. So now we want to determine where is this function is continuous. So what is the domain for p? Where is p continuous? So another very good pre-calculus question. What is the domain for tangent? Do you guys remember this? So, Shimon, you said no. Okay, that's fine. Thank you for being honest. <laughs> All right, so, Gabriel, you have negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Yeah. So, so domain of what well, were trig functions are continuous because these are periodic functions. They just repeat over and over, right? So, a good way to remember tangent is I like to remember the graph. So, I'm just going to draw how tangent t looks like. So tangent has asymptote at every pi over 2, right? So this is negative pi over 2. This is pi over 2. And it goes very nice and smooth in between them. And then it repeats again for another period of pi. So this would be pi and then this is 3 pi over 2. So another asymptote at 3 pi over 2. So and it goes again, same shape. So if we just take one period of this, we're going to uh, take, let's say, a uh, negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. And then you can add the next period, right? I'm going to take another period, pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2. And then so on right you can add more left side and right side hopefully you got the idea where this is going now what about sine where is sine continuous all real numbers yeah so sine is nice <laughs> sine and cosine they're like the best trick functions to talk about tangent is best too but it has asymptote so you have to remember that so, okay, so sine doesn't give us any trouble. P is the function that will give us trouble. Now, so that means the intersection of the two functions is, is the domain of tangent because that's the restricted function. Now, what is T naught? T naught is pi. Which interval does T naught fall into? So if you look at it, pi is located right here. That's where pi is. So it is sitting between pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. So we have unique solution on the open interval pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2. So that will be the unique solution. Uh, that will be the interval where we have unique solution for this linear differential equation. So any questions on this? So a good example to review again will be cotangent, right? So you want to know the domain for cotangent, uh, sine, cosine, ln, square root, uh, cube root. They're also nice functions to remember. Uh, yeah, and rational functions. For that, you'll have to kind of remember factoring. So this is the end for today's note. So we have a quiz one next class, right? And the topics are, so know how to classify them. We did that first day. And then 2.2, uh, 2.1, 2.4. So that will be on the quiz for next class. All right, so uh, <laughs> it is time to go. So I'll let you guys go. I will be here for another 15 to 20 more minutes. Those of you who needed me for office hours after class. So I'll be here today. If, 
if you want to go, you're good to go. I will see you all next class.